Alright, hello everyone, and welcome back. As you see, I have rearranged a few things in my room. Got the aquarium now, uh, just behind me to the left. Got some new bookcases we gotta fill back there. And I readjusted the lighting a bit, so hopefully you can see the, uh, the aquarium and the, the fish in there if it swims around. Okay, so as usual, if I could just have a few of you say hello when you get in and um, and are here, making sure that the, the audio is good, all of that. Hello, hello, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Alright, and as I will point out again later in case there's people coming in later, um, I'm wearing my, my t-shirt for you, the Ferris wheel. We've got the uh, FE2 Plus ring. So there you go. Okay, last time, and, and here you go, maybe you can see the fish a little better. It's usually hanging out right there. Um, might try to improve that for you at some point. <laughs> okay, anyway, last time we were talking about reactors and reactions in um, different setups. Essentially, the physical reactor that contains whatever reaction we're going to be doing. Now, if I get time, I will today do a little experiment, chemistry experiment with the uh, water from the aquarium uh, with a little pH testing to show you um, kind of in uh, live feed form how we measure pH with a, a little pH color strip. I don't know if this is gonna show. It's not showing up very well, okay. I may work on the lighting, but Essentially, we're going to cause the, the color to change based on the pH, and it's a good demonstration of some of the topics we're going to look at today in terms of um, chemical reactions, the equilibrium stuff there. But I want to pick up where we left off with talking about the three different physical types of reactors, whether it's a, a glass of water, which would be considered a batch reactor, or if it's a, um, a hose-like thing where we've got water uh, flowing through it. I'm going to come back and explain each of these in a little more depth. I think I got just far enough to be a little bit confusing last time. Okay, so <clears throat> let's take a little closer look at a batch reactor. So the batch reactors, again, it's like my glass of water here. If there's some reaction happening, then we might be accumulating, either in a positive sense or a negative sense, more or less of some constituent in there. Maybe some bacteria are growing, maybe we're destroying some bacteria. So when we take a look at the, the mass balance for a batch reactor, um, anything that's going to accumulate, since there's no inputs or outputs during operation, so when I say during operation, I mean I have a batch, it's sitting here, I'm stirring it, you know, we've got it perfectly mixed is our assumption. And then I'm letting it sit here for maybe 20 minutes before then I, I deem it safe to drink or I, the process is done and I pour that batch out and I start again. So whatever is accumulating or deaccumulating, going away, is going to be captured with just the reaction term. This makes batch cases very simple to understand the reactions. Um, we have no inputs or outputs because there's nothing flowing in or out. Now we might empty it and fill it up again later, but that's um, separate from the process. That's not a continuous occurrence. So these, there are no, no inputs, no outputs. We just have a completely mixed batch reaction. So that means our accumulation rate is equal to the reaction rate. If we want to be a little more specific, or in a general term, we can write that mathematically as in the volume, we have some accumulation DC per time, so some rate of accumulation. So if C is some concentration, so in that volume, we have the DC DT, the accumulation of some concentration, is going to be equal to, we'll go ahead and say the growth, if there's some 
reaction that's causing C to grow. So I'll say the rate of C growth minus the rate of C decay. Now, a lot of times we'll just have um, one and not the other. If we're disinfecting bacteria, we expect that our disinfectant is causing the population of bacteria to decay, um, and presumably they're not able to grow it during that time. So then in some cases, in most cases, it'll be just one or the other. When we get to biological treatment, we'll find that we, we do need to incorporate um, both in some circumstances, um, but we'll go in more depth there. So essentially we have this accumulation is just equal to the, the net reaction rate. So oftentimes it'll look like V dc dt is equal to V times, and then it'll depend a little bit on what reaction order we have. So in a first order case, it would be V times, so this would be first order growth times C to the one power. And this would be our reaction term. We're gonna elaborate on this a little more in a minute. But mostly what I wanted to show you is this is a, the batch, it's kind of like a swimming pool, you fill it up, the reactions occur, and at some point you might have to drain it, but you're not constantly filling and draining for the most part. In contrast to that, a CSTR, or a continuously stirred tank reactor, is the same thing, but they have constant inflow and constant outflow. So that's the, the key difference. It's still well mixed. We have, you know, still have some volume in here. This time we have a flow coming in and a flow going out. And usually associated, we would talk about an initial concentration going in and a final concentration going out, C. So C and C naught. <clears throat> Again, we're assuming perfect mixing this time our accumulation rate does include in and out and in fact we've already solved one of these um, last week when we took a look at when two streams mixed uh, essentially we had two streams coming in and one going out and we said this control volume was essentially you didn't recognize it yet, but that was essentially a CSTR where we had flows coming in and a flow going out. In that case, we had no reaction, and so we just ignored that term and we did our mass balance that way. Um, but a lot of times we will have a reaction, and then we have our accumulation within this control volume is going to be set up by this equation, and that's going to look something like QC naught minus QC plus the reaction term, which could be, let's say a growth, we'll have a plus there, VKC to the one power, that would be first order growth. We're gonna, again, we're gonna come back and be more specific and show you a couple different examples of how the reaction term exists in the mass balance. But when we set up the mass balance, this is what I wanted to show you. Most of the time, we're going to assume this accumulation is zero. So it's, that would be a steady state for these continuous systems. Um, if it's not, or even if it is, we can still write it this way. This would be the accumulation in the system. Within that volume, the accumulation of the concentration over time. Okay, so with that, the last one is the plug flow reactor. Plug flow reactor, these are, um, as I mentioned before, like a pipe or a hose where you have water flowing through it. Now we call it a plug flow because we assume that the water itself is gonna act a little bit like a plug, um, meaning that it's, we're gonna have this one section and that plug we're gonna assume is well mixed in itself. So perfect mixing only within the plug here. 
That means we're not mixing this section with this section. That becomes important for some of our reactions if, if they depend on how much concentration is here and it's decreasing over time, then right here at the beginning, we have a high concentration and maybe we're removing 10% of it every minute, then we don't want to be mixing with this that's already lower concentration. <clears throat> if we mixed with a lower concentration, then, you know, let's say this is half, then let's say this is at 50, just as a quick example. If we started with 100, by here it's 50, and here, let's say it's 75. If we mix 100 with 50, we get 75. So if we're removing 10% every, every minute, then that would be removing um, 7.5 removing instead of 10. So if we're removing as a percentage, having a plug flow, the initial amount we're removing every minute is 10, Whereas if they were mixed across this whole thing in this quick little example, we'd be removing less stuff. So sometimes we want this plug flow reactor to, because it allows us to remove more stuff over time um, through the system. That's different than this, uh, this CSTR because in the CSTR we have, again, let's use that 100 and 50. As soon as it reaches the tank and goes in, it's well mixed. So whatever is coming out is also what's in here. So C, C in the tank is equal to C that's coming out of the tank, which makes sense if you, if you think about perfectly mixed, as soon as you pour something into it, it gets diluted. And then what's coming out is this, um, the new concentration at 50. So it's nice because it makes it happen really fast. You go from 100 to 50 instantly, but if you're removing inside here, if that depends on how much concentration is there, then you, your system is in that sense less efficient than if you could be removing 10% of 100 instead of 10% of 50. Okay. We'll do some comparisons during the semester to make that a little more clear as, as to why the math works that way. For now, I'm gonna focus back again on what a plug flow reactor is like in practice. So if we have some inflow into a system, let's say we have maybe an aerial view here of a reactor and the water is flowing through and it's flowing through this baffled chamber so that it has to go through each of these chambers before it reaches the end. Might look something like this. And you can see it's going to have this snake-like progression through the, this chamber before it comes out. That would be a, a typical plug flow reactor setup. Okay, so given that, it, it's very obvious that the water here is not gonna mix with water here. Um, and that's by design, like we just talked about. And so with that, we treat this plug as if it is moving through the system, not mixing with its neighbors, just within itself. If we do that, then it's pretty much the same thing as if we had a, a little container a little batch container, fill it with water, send it on a conveyor belt, and then it pours out when it reaches the end. So we, we have this little container filled with water, and it just goes along, goes along, and then it gets poured out. So essentially it's like a batch reactor that is held and the reaction is allowed to occur for the same amount of time that the water exists in this chamber. So then we need to know how much time does this spend? And there's a little tau here that's, um, I'm gonna introduce it in a moment. That's the same thing as what we call theta 
or hydraulic resonance time. All right, so hydraulic resonance time. This is a key design parameter that we're gonna use in many of our problems in almost every section. So make sure you tune in here, make sure you understand what, we, what we're talking about when we say hydraulic resident, retention time or residence time. You can say either one. I've been saying hydraulic residence time, retention, it's a synonym, we can use either one. So we define this term as theta equals volume divided by flow rate. And because I want to keep fewer typos here, I'm going to fix that typo real quick. Not a floor rate, it's a flow rate. All right. Okay, so Q is the flow rate, V is the volume. This means if we take a look at the units, we have meters cubed divided by meters cubed per second. This turns into seconds on top. This is an example. You know, maybe it's days. Um, so essentially, it can be any unit of time. What you want to make sure, though, is if you're comparing the hydraulic resonance time um, to a flow rate, you want to make sure that if you were asked to report it in days, that you convert from seconds to days and all that. Okay, so this is just a simple parameter. It's called time. Do this unit analysis if you forget how to define it. It's theta, V, and Q. Um, theta is a time, so with that you should be able to figure out that it should be V over Q because Q over V is gonna be um, per time, and that's not correct. So make sure you just are familiar with this. I'm not giving you this one on the equation sheet because I just think it's that fundamental, that easy, that important that you just commit that to memory and understand what we're doing there. Okay, so I have a, a short YouTube video to show you in light of this. This is showing what we call a tracer test when, um, when water goes through here, we'll see they've added dye and this dye is showing how long the water takes to go through this reactor. So we see as it's going, this is similar to a plug flow reactor, right? We have this uh, chamber that's we're sweeping through. The water is not, not well mixed across everything, but we can see that perhaps it's reasonable to assume that in some plug it's almost well mixed. That's their intent anyway, to apply this dye in a kind of in a full um, horizontal, or I guess vertical line here. And so we see as the water is flowing through, um, we actually see a few things. In our class, we're going to assume that we have perfect reactors, um, so ideal reactors. In this example, we see even, you know, this is just some sort of a, a laboratory type example, we see spots where there's less dye in some areas and more in others. We see that the mixing is not perfect. We see kind of around this structure here, there's some areas that really aren't getting much flow. Um, we might call them uh, dead zones. Some areas have a lot of extra dye. Over here we have this spot, this would be a dead zone where it's just really not, not getting much of the, the flow, not much mixing. And in a real reactor, that would be a bit of a problem because that means water is staying there longer than we predicted. Another thing we see is some of the water is flowing faster than the other. So anything that went around the long ways in the bend probably took a little bit longer. And anything that, anything that's um, not in, near the middle, anything that's near next to one of the edges probably had some force of drag acting on it to prevent it from going quite as fast as it would have otherwise. Okay, so in our, in our calculations, we're gonna assume ideal reactors. And this is, you know, obviously this amount of complexity would make calculations difficult. So that's, that's probably 
uh, a big reason why. If we are working with non-ideal reactors, we often use a tracer test, something like that, to estimate that retention time. How long does the water stay in that system based on adding some sort of a tracer? And so there's ways we can estimate, okay, how ideal is it? How, what are some problems with it? If we look at how much dye is coming out over time, if we were to look at the concentration of dye coming out over time. If we added dye like that video showed, that would be called a continuous, continuous dye addition, basically. We'd have nothing coming out for a little while, and then we'd start to have some, and then we'll see that eventually we reach the concentration that the dye is being added to the water. And based on when this time happens, we can say, oh, okay, the, the average hydraulic resonance time may be somewhere around here or something. Um, you could also do like a pulse input. Like if you just added a few, um, a few drops of dye and then that was that, you know, some food coloring or whatever. If we did it that way, then we'd see kind of the same thing. We'd see the dye increase and then eventually it would tail off and usually, if the reactor is not ideal, we have some large tail here where some of the dye kind of got stuck and it was slow to come out. And then again, you could use some math to find, okay, well, the, the average then we can say is here. Um, let's rename that to theta because we're using theta here. So that would be our estimation of theta. Um, and that should be somewhere near V over Q. V over Q is for the ideal reactor. Um, so don't worry too much about this. I just wanted to show you that illustration to see how it's done in, in real life and how we can estimate that given the, the factors that make our ideal cases not actually correct. Okay, so now I wanna get into the math. Um, how do we set up a max balance to solve for something we're interested in if we have an ideal batch case? Yes, I did move the aquarium. Um, so it's, it's now right here, putting in some bookcases over there. Don't have the shelves on them yet, but um, yeah, it's good. Okay, can you explain again what exactly theta calculates? Yes, so theta is calculating, and this is, this is what I showed you this um, thing for. Theta is gonna calculate how long it takes for water being added. So let's say at time zero, water was added right here, or this dye. Theta is gonna calculate how long it takes for that water to travel through the system. And really what we're talking about is the average time for water collectively. So the average time that water, so hydraulic, resides in the reactor. So theta is um, telling us how long it takes, you know, in the, in the previous case, how long it would take for this plug to make it all the way through the system. Or it tells us on average, how long does water stay in here? Now, looking at a, a continuously stirred reactor, some of the water exits immediately. But some of it, you know, if you were to consider adding two million water molecules to a tiny little reactor, it's stirring and some of them is going out uh, constantly, we're adding some constantly. When we add them, some of them will escape immediately just because it's perfectly mixed. And then some of them will hang around there for some time before eventually they, they find their way out. So theta is just giving us an average amount of time that water spends in these systems. And let, let me know if you need any further clarification. Okay, so in terms of the math, our end goal is to be able to use the very basic principle that 
we have conservation of mass. We're not going to create or destroy any mass. Using that, okay, let me, let me answer this. Is resonance time similar to space time in reactors? I'm not sure what you mean by space time. Um, it, it, there might be another term that's used sometimes that, that could be one of them. Um, so it, maybe. All right, so in a batch case, what we're going to, you know, and in a batch case, remember, this is just simply water being stirred in a, in a tank, in a bucket, in a jar, whatever. So what we want to do is take a look at how the accumulation is working, how, this, how we can write this equation in order to be able to solve for some term. So here I have written the goal is to use reaction order to insert the correct reaction term into the mass balance. So last time we learned about the different reaction orders and then we moved on to the reactor types. So given two things, two pieces of information, the reactor type and the reaction order and whether or not it's uh, positive or you know it's a growth or decay, we should be able to set up a mass balance and correctly put in that reaction term into this uh, portion. So we're going to start with an example, zero order decay reaction in a batch case. Okay. So when we say, when we write zero order decay, we can write this as R of C, the reaction of C. It's the same thing as writing, you know, you know we know that that's DC DT, the change in concentration over time is equal to negative K times C to the zero power, because this was the zero order. Um, we put a negative here because it's a decay. So that's a decay reaction at zero order. Now, that's the reaction term. Now we need to put it in the context of our, of our reactor. So considering the accumulation rate, we're gonna say the accumulation in some volume so volume times that accumulation, dc, dt. This is, we use dc, dt for the accumulation term regardless of what type of reactor we have, okay? This is going to be equal to what's coming in, which is zero, right? There's nothing coming in. There's nothing going out. So we have zero minus zero, that's the in and out, plus the reaction term. And here I'm gonna say we could write growth minus decay, but in this time, we're just gonna have zero for the growth. Minus the decay, which is right here. K times C to the one. Now this is also occurring within the volume. So essentially our accumulation rate V DC DT is all just equal to negative K V. All right, it becomes very simple. I'm sorry, this was supposed to be C to the zero because that's zero order. So to simplify, we can get rid of the Vs and then we're left with DC DT is equal to negative K. And here we need to separate and integrate. So we can say DC equals negative K DT. And then we can take the integral of DC from C naught to C and of DT from time zero to time T. Okay, so this is all stuff you've seen before. Just putting it together here in a simple, a simple integration. So on the left, when we integrate 
essentially one DC from C naught to C, this is going to give us C naught minus C, or excuse me, C minus C naught. equals, and over here it's just going to be negative k t, because it would be time t at time zero is zero. So this is our equation, and if we're solving for c, then we can say c equals c naught minus k t. You've probably seen this type of um, equation before, and in fact, as we'll see today, a lot of these are directly analogous to physics equations. So the um, the velocity of some object moving it changes with time. The but it doesn't depend on um, you know. In that case, it's in terms of the so acceleration depends on. Um, the velocity term. It's like growing by some amount uh, per time. Velocity is just constant. It's, it's, the object moves at a constant speed. So this would be very similar to your velocity equation. Now the first order decay equation, we can do the exact same process. We are still in a batch reactor. So we say in some volume, we have an accumulation that's equal to equal to essentially all of this minus k c to the one power times v. Okay, uh, so there's a question, so it wouldn't be a minus, wouldn't be minus a minus k in the first equation you wrote. Um, up here, the reason I, I wrote it the way I did is because when we add this reaction, we can just say it's plus each reaction term. So it's plus um, every type of reaction we have. So plus R of growth, plus R of decay, plus R of something else, plus R of X, Y, and Z. You know, whatever reactions we have, we just add them there. And then if it's a decay reaction, we will include it in that por portion. Um, so it doesn't matter how many reactions or what they are, we're just going to add them on the end and let the direction um, influence how we write it in that spot. Um, does that make sense? Let me know if that, that helps. Okay, great. And by the way, um, I just got a, an email from LSU the other day that um, if I'm posting this type of content on, on the web, um, I'm supposed to get your permission if I'm using your name or face or anything like that. So I'm just gonna assume that um, your usernames, I encouraged you earlier in the year to put them how you like. Feel free to change them if, you're, if you do not consent to all that. I'm just going to assume that nobody has has the information there, so I don't need to get the special forms from you all. Um, but just wanted to, to make a comment because I was thinking about that. And thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and it, the uh, this reaction, these reaction terms do get a little confusing sometimes. It's like, where do you put the minus and how does that come out? So it's so a very good question. Okay, so volume here. Um, for this first order decay equation, we can say we've got the volumes are going to cancel, and now we're left with dc dt is equal to negative k times c. Here we're going to do the same operation, dc equals negative k. This time I'm going to pair the c with the dc over here, so we need to divide both sides by c. So we're going to do the integration by parts again from zero to t on this side. And this time we have the integral of dc over c. You've seen this before, but it might have been a while. So the integral of one over x is, 
think about it. You'll probably remember, or if you needed to look it up, you'll find that the integral of 1 over x dx is exactly the ln of x. So here we, we're integrating it from c naught to c, so what we end up with is the natural log of c minus natural log of c naught. And over on the other side, it's the same as before, negative kt. There's another way of writing this. The, um, there's one of the logarithm rules here. This is the same thing as writing the natural log of c divided by c naught. So with two logarithm rules, or excuse me, two pieces of math from memory, we can now solve this equation. And I'm going to encourage you to, to remember these two pieces so that you can do it on your own without any issues. The first one is the integral of 1 over x dx, and that, that's natural log of x. The other is that when you combine, when you have natural log of something minus the natural log of something else, it's the same thing as writing it the natural log of a over b. So we have then natural log of c over c naught equals negative kt. And I'm going to come up over here. We can further simplify, take e to the power of both, both sides. That gets rid of our natural log. So c over c naught is then equal to e to the minus kt. Starting to get very familiar looking here. We can say c equals c naught times e to the minus kt. Now, if you're scratching your head wondering why you've seen this so many times before, it's because you've learned it at least many years ago in algebra. In basic algebra, you should have learned this equation for how to calculate interest. I mentioned last time that first order equations, there's a good analogy in money in a bank earning or costing interest, you know, if, whether it's debt or, a, you know, debt for loans, um, negative interest or principal earning positive interest. It should look like this. Maybe it's a plus if you're looking at growth. Um, but essentially, we just derived why that equation exists. It's a first order reaction that depends on how much stuff is there. So some problems you're going to want to keep it in the C over C naught form to say, okay, what fraction is remaining? Sometimes you might want how much was removed and then it would be one minus C over C naught as a fraction. You know, maybe you have 1% remaining, so 1 in every 100 you started with is the fraction that remains. That means you removed 99 out of 100. And as a fraction, that's 0 0.01 remaining, or 90, 0.99 removed. So keep that in mind. You might not always want it just in C. You, sometimes you might want it in C naught. What did you start with? Maybe you're solving for K. Um, or maybe you're solving for time. The point of the mass balance here is to set up a principle the, based on the, the fact, the principle that our, we're not going to create or destroy matter and we know some sort of a reaction is happening, we can then derive whatever equation we need to solve for any of these components that are at play in the system. Okay, so given all that, we're going to do the same process for a CSDR, but we'll notice that the input and output are not zero. And while I'm here, let me note, make this note that the same process holds true for plug flow reactors, except that instead of using the time here, we'll insert theta. Okay, so because I told you the plug flow is like a batch reactor, except that it's on a conveyor belt and it just spends some amount of time on the conveyor belt before it gets dumped out, we can use that same the same exact math here for the plug flow reactor, except instead of a time, we're going to use theta. How long does it last? How long does the um, water stay in the system before it gets dumped out? Okay, then we actually have two out of the three reactor types completed. Um, okay, very good question. 
um, how do we know which order of a reaction is taking place? This has to do with what we learned last time in terms of, uh, we were talking about the different reaction orders. And actually, let me back up to, the, to this real quick. So last time we talked about the reaction orders and I did this, uh, the rate analysis for the, um, the units. And I'm glad you asked because it's, it's very important that you understand how you can find this from a problem. Because a lot of times it'll, a problem will tell you about the, the rate, but it might not tell you directly enough for you to say, oh, okay, this is, it might not explicitly say a zero order reaction. Um, for zero order reactions, the fact that it depends zero times on concentration will tell us something about the units for K because ultimately the units on the right side of this equation, you know, the expression for the rate, have to match the units on the left side. So the units on the left side are always going to be concentration per time. And that's because when we put it in some volume, it's mass per time, which is our ultimately the mass balance that we're doing. Okay, so on the right side, we have to have units of concentration per time. That means since this guy goes to one for a zero order reaction, K must be concentration per time units to make this satisfied. So then we see the K is milligrams per liter per second. Um, so that, that one satisfies it that way. First order reactions, same analysis here. We have C to the power of one. That means that K times C must be milligrams per liter per second in this case. So the only thing that's missing is the per second. So that's why we have K in this time as per second. So if you were given an equation or given a reaction and you were given the rate constant was per time units, you know that's a first order. In fact, if you, again, think about you know, mortgage rates or interest rates, they're always talked about some percent. Oh, I'm earning 4% interest in this specialized savings account. What's not said and what's left implied is that's per year. It's 4% per year. Um, sometimes maybe they'll specify and it's like some sort of a monthly basis or something and whatever, but APR, annual, annual percent interest, that's a percent per year. The units are actually per year. Percentage is not like a, a unit. That's, that's just referring back to the fact that it depends on the amount you have, the amount of principal or balance or whatever, to one power. And then K is per year. So to say an APR of five is to say um, K is 0 0.05 per year. Because that's 5% of what you had per year, and it's growing or decaying or whatever. Okay, same thing with second order. We're not gonna use these very often, but the units have to match. So the rate constant for a second order are going to be um, liters per milligram per second in, in the example of milligrams, liters and seconds. This could be cubic meters and kilograms and days. So don't, don't get caught up on what type of units they are. I mean, the specific unit, but the type. So it's gonna be mass or number per volume per time. Um, okay, does that answer the question? Does that make sense? Let me know if you need um, more clarification there. All right, for the CSDR, uh, again, this is the reactor where we have it well mixed in some bucket of water, except that we have drilled a hole in the bucket on two sides to insert pipes so that we have water flowing in and water flowing out. You could imagine a pond where we have a stream flowing in the pond and some, maybe we've got a dam or something and some stream going out as well. So whatever the case, we have water coming in, water going out, 
and maybe some reaction happening in the middle of it. So we're going to take a look at adding that reaction term to our system. Great. All right. For the zero order decay, again, for this slide and the previous one, I would encourage you to try this, doing it on your own, to do growth. Try the zero order growth, try the first order growth on your own. They're going to look similar, but there will be some differences. So I'm just going to write this here, try growth on your own. Okay, in this case, we have uh, our reaction term is the same as it was. The dc dt is equal to negative kc times zero, uh, c to the zero power. So this is gonna be the reaction term that goes into the, the mass balance. I'm going to assume, well, let me write it out and then we're gonna make the assumption. We're not always gonna assume steady state, but a lot of times we will. So we have accumulation in some volume, D, V, D, C, D, T. This is our accumulation term. Equals the input term. And typically we're gonna write this as Q and we have a, a C naught. Then we have a Q here, this is in some volume, and a C. So we're gonna have, what's coming in is Q times C naught. So Q times C naught, this in units wise, this is something like milligrams, oh, excuse me, let's say, um, so flow rate would be, let's say liters per minute. Then we're gonna multiply that by C, which let's say is milligrams per liter. This is giving us, liters cancel, mass per minute, okay? So that gives us milligrams per minute let's check to make sure that, because here we're gonna subtract. So this is the units of this component, because it's not, we're not multiplying or dividing it by anything else, they have to match the units of the left side. So just double checking that here, we see that volume times concentration per time, that's going to be, let's say liters times milligrams per liter per minute. So the liters cancel, and we're left with milligrams per minute, just like over here. So I just wanted to be very explicit there to show you what we're doing is essentially showing this mass balance is going to end up working out units wise um, as, we're, as we're working through this problem. And it's important that, that it stays that way. Okay, so Q times C minus Q times, so it's Q C naught minus Q times C. So this is what's coming in. This is what's going out. And then we have our reaction term. So I'm just gonna add the reaction term and then in the parentheses, incorporate whatever negative or anything I need. And this type, in this case, we just have a, a decay term. So we have minus K times c to the zero power is just one. So I'm just gonna say times one. Okay. If we assume that the, this has been happening for a long time, that's a good question. Let me go ahead and answer that. Is the Q the same or is it Q1 and Q2? The Qs will usually be the same unless we have multiple inputs and outputs. So. If we had a system where we had a flow coming in here, a flow coming in here, and then let's say randomly three different flows going out, we would have to label each Q. So this would be Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and Q5. Now, we would still be able to say that what's going in is equal to going what's going out, because we're never gonna deal with a system where we change the volume. That it's just, complicated um i mean we could do it there we you guys are actually going to have the math basically to be able to do it but it just gets kind of too messy one thing we could say in this little diagram is q1 plus q2 is equal to 
q3 plus q4 plus q5 because we're going to have a water balance we're never going to have more water coming in than is going out or less does that make sense so in, in most cases if we just have one and the other we'll just leave it as q um, and the same q across all of it going to need this space in a minute so go ahead and get rid of this so great questions today thank you all right so let's go ahead and make the assume assumption that we have steady state so I think I talked about it last time. So the steady state assumption is the accumulation term is zero. That means just like the water we just talked about, we're not gaining or subtracting water in total in the system. We are also not gaining or subtracting the amount of C inside the control volume. Now we might be having some reaction that's decreasing it, but that just means that the what's coming in is higher concentration than what's going out. So that's going to be what we like for most of our water treatment systems is for that to be true. Um, so given that, we want and, you know, in this case, if we're treating water, we want to decrease the amount of C. Um, we would like to have a system that's very simple. We're adding, let's say, 100 milligrams of this waste per liter, and we have only five coming out, five milligrams per liter coming out. So the reaction is what's decreasing it. And the total, we have, we have then 100 coming in, 95 being removed by the reaction, and five going out the other way. So that means that we're not accumulating, we just have kind of a constant amount of C in that system. So then if accumulation is zero, we can say zero equals QC naught minus QC minus K. Um, sorry, I missed the V here. K times V. Because again, this reaction is occurring in the, in the whole control volume. Okay. So with this, we can solve for C. Again, we're just gonna assume that C is what we're interested in. We could solve for volume or the flow rate or C naught. We can solve for different pieces, but right now we're gonna solve for C. So that's gonna be kind of the most common. All right, so in this case, let's go ahead and move Q, C over here equals QC naught minus K times V. Now, one thing we can do is divide everything by Q. That's gonna help. And again, because we have the same Q on both sides here, that's pretty convenient. C equals C naught minus K times V over Q. And if you were paying attention earlier, you would recognize that V over Q is the same thing as our hydraulic retention time, K theta. So here we already see one way in which theta is useful as a design parameter. So it's applied directly right there. It captures both pieces of information into one value. That's nice because if we have a small volume, but a slow flow rate, we can have a long time. Um, or we could have a very large volume and a very high flow rate and still have the same amount of residence time. Okay. That's the zero order reaction. I encourage you to do that same process for your the growth equation. Okay, how did I move the V over to just the growth term? I'm sorry, I didn't move any Vs. I meant to have this V here. So whenever we're doing a reaction rate, this is within some volume. So the reaction is occurring in a volume. And so we had to have the V here and I just forgot to put it there. Um, so the V was here the whole time. Um, and then, so the V stays here. 
I wasn't moving anywhere. I just said this whole term went to zero. So this went to zero. I didn't move the V or, or anything like that. It was just, just the fact that I forgot it. Yeah. Okay. So when we do the same thing over here with the first order, we're going to end up using first order decays quite often in, um, in CSTRs. And I'll answer that question in just a moment. Um, so what I would encourage you to do is instead of memorize this last equation thing, understand how to get there um, so that you feel confident using it and getting to it. Now, to answer your question there, um, do we always assume it's steady state for CSTR? No, in fact, I know that we're going to, we're probably going to do um, at least one homework problem in your, probably your first homework assignment post um, later this week or maybe next week, where we have a system that's not at steady state. If it's not at steady state, we have to keep V, um, and let me go ahead and actually write this. Uh, so not steady state. So that means the accumulation equals V dc dt. So we might have to integrate something. So in a case like this, let's just start it just to kind of show you. We're not going to do many this way. Most of them will be steady state. But if we do need to do it, we've got V dc dt equals what's coming in, qc naught minus what's going out, qc. And then let's again use a zero order decay here. Um, plus a negative V um, K. So here, uh, let's go ahead and divide everything by V, dc dt equals Q over V. Actually, yeah, we'll, we'll do this, that's fine. Q over V, C naught. You know, instead of doing that, I'm gonna divide everything by Q. Uh, I think that'll be simpler. Um, so we're going to divide V over Q. So this is going to give us theta. Over here, it's going to be C naught minus C, because we're going to divide everything by Q, um, minus V over Q times K. All right, so now if we divide everything by V over Q, so divide everything by theta, we have DC DT equals C naught minus C divided by theta minus K. All right, then it's a matter of integrating. Um, so we'd want to separate, get C over here on the left side. Um, so it'd be DC divided by C naught minus C and integrating that. And then on the right side, we'd be integrating a one over theta minus k, all of that times t. So that would require um, integration. We could do that, um, but I'm, I'm not usually going to, to make you do that. There's a, um, the problem that we're gonna work on actually has, it's looking at the stomach as a CSTR and you eat a hamburger and then you're no longer eating hamburger, you just have that mass in there. And then there's no C naught gets rid of that term, that makes the integration simpler and a bit more straightforward. So then it becomes a problem pretty similar to other ones that we've done before, or that we've already just talked about. So yeah, we, we're not always gonna assume that, but you see that it just makes for a slightly more complicated integration. So generally, I'm not gonna have you do much of that. Um, and if I do, I'm gonna be careful, maybe it'll just be stick sticking with homeworks, or it'll be very carefully explained on an exam um, to make sure that you're not uh, completely lost there. So it's certainly possible. Really, it's we don't want our systems usually to be operating in non-steady state in, in most cases. So I'm not, that's not going to be a focus of mine for you. But one thing I do want you to know is you, that you have the tools to do it. Um, this mass balance setup is a toolkit that you can use for all sorts of um, 
systems. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the first order decay in a CSDR. Let's go ahead and derive this one. We have V dc dt equals what's coming in, Q C naught, minus what's going out, Q C, plus our reaction term. In this case, it's negative V K C to the one power. Okay, and I remember the V this time, that's good. We're going to assume steady state. So this goes to zero. Then we have QC naught minus QC minus VKC. Now, this time, I think it'll make sense to divide everything by C and divide everything by Q. So we can say zero equals C naught divided by C minus one because we divided basically everything by this term, minus, um, you know, maybe, let's not divide by C yet. Let's just do V, sorry. I retract. Okay, we're just dividing by Q like we did last time. Zero equals C naught minus C minus theta, because V over Q, K C. Now I just want to get the C terms together, so I add C to both, add, uh, really add both of these to both sides. So we have C plus theta KC equals C naught. We can factor out a C and say one plus theta K equals C naught. And then if we're solving for C, we can just simply say C equals C naught divided by one plus theta K. And sometimes we might be interested in C over C naught. So that would be that fraction that is remaining. And that would be one over one plus theta K. So you'll, you'll end up seeing these two terms fairly often. Um, did I? Do the, yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, and then if we were to do a, um, a growth equation, I think this, this one would flip and it would be pretty similar otherwise. Okay, so again, try this on your own, do the growth equation side and see if you can come up with the same terms. You will see these um, fairly often and it'll be good for you to get comfortable early with doing these derivations and understanding how the reaction type, the order, and whether it's decay or growth, fits into the overall mass balance. Again, if you master the, the setup and the use of the overall mass balance as kind of this governing principle, letting you do math to figure out the answer to the problems, you're gonna be just fine in the class. This, this is the, the biggest deal is understanding and applying how to do that mass balance um, for the different systems. Okay, I've got an example here. Um, and so if there are any questions, feel free uh, as we're moving through this. And it looks like we're actually gonna to get to the chemistry next time, so I guess I was a little premature wearing the uh, chemistry shirt for you. Um, so let's go ahead and do this example problem. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it and then I'm going to um, give you a, a few moments to uh, contemplate. And then I'm not going to wait, you know, five minutes to let you solve the whole thing. What I'm going to do is just say, if you want five minutes, go ahead and pause the stream and then um, turn it back on once you've gotten enough time through it to, to hit any um, issues or have any questions. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and uh, read it for you and on the next slide we'll go ahead and kind of start setting it up. I'll pause for a moment in case there's any immediate questions and then I'll go ahead and start solving it and then walking you through it um, 
and that, you know, you have control over whether or not you pause, and so feel free to make use of that. Okay, so this is from our book, example 1.5. We have a polluted lake. It says, consider a 10 times 10 to the 6 cubic meter lake fed by a polluted stream having a flow rate of 5 cubic meters per second and a pollutant concentration equal to 10 milligrams per liter. And we've got that figure here. There is also a sewage outfall that discharges half a cubic meter per second of wastewater having a pollutant concentration of 100 milligrams per liter. The stream and the sewage wastes have a decay, decay rate coefficient of 0 0.20 per day. Assuming the pollutant is completely mixed in the lake and assuming no evaporation or other water losses or gains, find the steady state pollutant concentration in the lake. Okay, just a few things to point out here. As I read, um, it made this assumption, no evaporation or other water losses or gains. That was what I was talking about earlier when we were saying Q1, Q2, and Q3. Um, these are gonna balance because we have no other water losses or gains. And in fact, the book wrote it as Q for the stream, Q for the waste, W and Q mixed for the outgoing mixture. Sorry. So that was one thing that I noticed immediately. Another thing was they gave us some information about the decay rate coefficient. So think about that a moment and see if you can tell what reaction rate order that is. It also told us that the uh, it's a decay. So K is 0 0.20 per day. So if you were to write the R decay for C, it would look like negative K, because it's decay, you have the negative times C to the what power? So ask yourself, what power would that be? Okay, it also, the last thing I'm going to mention here is it said find the steady state pollutant concentration in the lake. So that means that it's been happening, we have the steady state assumption, and we don't have to worry about any accumulation in the lake. Okay, now hopefully you, uh, you were thinking about this, the 0.2 per day, that's going to be a first order. Um, per time is first order reactions. So that's going to be what our reaction term looks like, and then we add it into the context of this particular lake. All right, so go ahead, um, take a couple moments. What we're looking for is CM. All of the information is actually still right here on the page. So go ahead and take a look at that. And I'll give you a couple moments uh, to think about it, ask any questions you have, or pause if you need. So I'm going to go ahead and get started working on this. Everything on this diagram is already labeled. If it was not already labeled, I would um, go ahead and start working on that. So to get this CM, one thing I know is we're probably going to want to first balance the Qs. So Q mixed, we don't know that. This is going to be equal to the QS plus Q. Q waste, that's going to be 5 plus 0.5, so 5.5 5 
cubic meters per second. Okay, got that part. Now we need to set up our mass balance and set it up in such a way that we can solve for C. We already know that this is going to be a first order decay. So when we set up our mass balance, we know it's a steady state system. So zero equals what's coming in. So QS CS plus the other thing that's coming in. So we can look at this whole term as what's coming in. QW CW. This is our input term. Minus what's going out. QM CM plus our reaction, which is going to happen in some volume. This will be volume times, excuse me, I'm just going to put the negative there, volume times the K times C to the one power. Okay, from here we can solve basically like we have before, and what we're looking for is the C. Now, one thing to notice here, the C here is going to be the same as the C here. So C equals CM. Because we were told it's well mixed. That was another thing that was mentioned, um, that it's, it's essentially a CSDR. <clears throat> okay. So with that, we have, we can go ahead and write it here. Let's go ahead and rewrite this. Zero equals QS CS plus QW CW minus QM CM minus V K C M. All right, so we can go ahead and get the C's together. So QM CM plus V K C M equals Q S C S plus Q W C W. You can factor out the C M. And if you notice, I'm just keeping this algebraic um, with general terms for now. We have all sorts of numbers, but I wanted to go ahead and simplify uh, before writing out all the numbers because I think that'll uh, keep things a little simpler. So here we have CM factoring out of this. So we've got QM plus VK equals QS CS plus QWCW. So CM then, in the general term, would be QS CS plus QWCW divided by QM plus V K. Now it's just a matter of putting in all the numbers. So we could say CM is equal to QS, which is five cubic meters per second times CS, which was 10 milligrams per liter plus QW was 0 0.5 cubic meters per second times 100 milligrams per liter. All that divided by 5.5 cubic meters per second plus the volume, which was 10 times 10 to the 6. And we can just write that as 10 to the seventh cubic meters. And this is times K, which is per day, times 0 0.2 day to the minus one. Okay, so now one thing I wanted to, to mention here, or to take a look at, let's take a look at the units before we actually solve. We have five cubic meters per second times 10 milligrams per liter, and then same units, milligram, cubic meters per second and milligrams per liter. On the bottom, we have cubic meters per second 
and we have cubic meters and per day. So this per day, we need to convert into seconds to make it consistent. Now you'll notice that we only have cubic meters and seconds on the bottom, and we're left with milligrams per liter on the top once we do the final solution. That's perfect because we are looking for milligrams per liter here. So we need to either convert all the seconds into days or we can convert this days into seconds. So let's go ahead and do the, the latter. So 0 0.2, um, one over day, we can multiply this by, uh, let's see, one day per 86,400 seconds should give us the conversion and that gets us our K in per seconds instead. Okay, when we put that all together, I'll go ahead and do this in Excel to make it a little bit simpler. We'll have C equals, or I could just look up the book, but we've got just a couple minutes here, so we'll go ahead and do this. All right, so let's say we want to solve for CM, and we have, this is going to be equal to five times 10, which that's gonna be uh, 50, plus the 0.5 times 100 is also 50, so we could have just said 100 on the top. So 50 plus 0.5 times 100, all, right, all that divided by 5.5, plus 10, if we do e to the seventh, that gets us, um, actually what I should do is 10 e to the sixth. So that's 10 times 10 to the sixth. The e is times 10 to the, um, so when we do 10 times 10 to the sixth power, that's 10 to the seventh, is how I wrote it there. Um, but if I do 10 e here in Excel, that that e means times 10. So I need to do 10, either 10 e6 or 10 to the seventh is fine. Either one of those. And then I multiply by this two and divide by 86,400. That should give us the correct answer as 0.42. And maybe just to be sure, I'm gonna add a couple parentheses to make sure I did that correctly. Okay, so C should be 0.42. Uh, considering for a moment what we started with, the incoming stream had 10, the wastewater stream had 100, and the final value of point, um, 0.42. Sounds like it's possible. Um, 0.42 milligrams per liter. So that should be the final answer, and just because I have it right here, I'm gonna go ahead and double check in the book to make sure I don't do something funny. Uh, it's not 0.2, it's two. Ah, that would, that would explain it. Okay, so the answer then is probably um, 4.2 then. I, I, I was feeling something was slightly off, so I apologize there. Yeah, it was 2.0 is what it was, right? That's how they wrote it. So then this should be Oh, are you saying when I wrote it in here? I see. Okay, so point two here. Okay, three point four nine. I'm sorry, I was confused by the what you said there, but I, so it was, and let me just go back a step. It did give us 0.2, and then I wrote it in Excel incorrectly. So 0 0.2. And in Excel, now that I have it corrected, we have 0.2 there and 3.49 is our final answer. Okay.
Thank you for that correction. Does that look good? Okay, yeah, I'll explain that in just a second. Um, and yeah, the, the final answer, maybe you'll be able to see here, does say 3.5. It's in, it's in the book, in case you're interested. Okay, so how do we know it's a CSDR, not a PFR problem? It's a good question. So let's go back and read it again. We see there's a lake fed by a polluted stream, um, flow rate, uh, there is a sewage outfall, pollutant discharge. Um, it says, assuming the pollutant is completely mixed in the lake, that's what tips us off. The pollutant is completely mixed in the lake. So that tells us it cannot be a plug flow because the whatever pollutant is here is also mixed with whatever is here, right? It's that complete mixing means that we're not we're not following any sort of like a, a snake-like pattern or anything. And, you know, maybe some, maybe a stream system where you had like meandering back and forth, and maybe there's some sort of channel in a lake and it ends up, or maybe it's kind of a long, narrow lake, that, that would make sense. But in this case, that's what tips us off. That's a CSDR. And that's all, I'm already over time, I apologize. Um, so that'll be it for today. I will remain live just for a moment longer in case there are any questions, but otherwise have a good day and we will pick up on uh, Thursday. It's a good question. I don't know. And, um, maybe your peers can answer if there's anybody who's made a group me for the class. for now.